Welcome to episode 35 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Zagari. And this is a Best Picture Showdown, our third to be exact. First time we did Kramer vs. Kramer for episode 25. That was the 1979 films and we had a blast doing that. Then we did The Apartment from 1960 for episode 30. Had some fun. Really, really enjoyed Elmer Gantry. <laughs> uh, some of the other films, uh, you know, we could, we could leave them there. But here, the 89th Academy Awards. We're talking about Moonlight, the Best Picture winner. And there's a bunch of other films that it went against because, you know, this category is all over the place. Uh, Connor and I have seen all of these films. We, most of them have rewatched during the past month or so. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about that. But what I do want to talk about here is you and I, uh, you just turned 26 recently. I turned 26 today. So uh, how about that? Moonlight is definitely one of my favorite movies of all time. So this is a treat. Um, you know, when this came out, we were both 21. I wanted, I wanted to get a, kind of get an idea. We, we don't normally get to do this because we're talking about old movies when we weren't alive. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, we, we were very much here for what was going on and both 21 years old. What was going on in your life, uh, in your movie going world? And what were you doing? Were, were you in school? Uh, what was going on in Connor, Connor's life at 21? Uh, well, first of all, happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Uh, 21 years old. I was in the middle of college um, at Texas State University. I think my sophomore year. Um, recently went back to uh, for grad school, so still in school. I was two years into Filmgasm.com as a movie review website. Uh, the podcast hadn't even crossed my mind yet. I No, I, I had no idea who you were. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a, I was very much a get, watch whatever I can get a hold of mentality. But I also was kind of choosy with what I saw at the movies. Because I was very much like, do I want to spend my money to see this or that? It didn't occur to me that I should see everything. At the time, I was like, I want to see something that I know is going to be entertaining. So yeah. of these films i i've seen i saw four of them at the movies uh what are the films we have moonlight the winner we have arrival fences hacksaw ridge hell or high water hidden figures la la land lion and manchester by the sea interesting group very interesting group extremely <laughs> i saw at the movies i saw arrival hacksaw ridge hidden figures and la la land um, I didn't watch Moonlight until after the Oscars. Yes. Because I hadn't quite gotten to the point where I wanted to see all the nominees. I was still like, I'm going to see what I think is going to be good. And this was around the time of, I think the next Oscars was when I was like, I need to see all of these. And uh, yeah, at the time of the Oscars, I had not yet seen Moonlight, Fences, or Lion. And uh, okay. Okay. Going in, you know, with, with an incomplete list, you don't have the same uh, gusto with a lot of these films. Like I didn't know anything about Moonlight, so I wasn't rooting for it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 So it is interesting to kind of look back at who we were when this was going down. Cause we've, you know, this show, all these shows have really kind of rounded us into much more learned uh, film people. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. 100%. I love it. I love, I, I, I hear everything you're saying. And I know that in 2016, you know, you knew what kind of a movie fan you were already. You yeah. knew what you liked, you knew what you were going to dig. I, I can't say the same for myself uh, at that time at age 21. Uh, I moved to Houston, Texas, like right at the beginning of the year uh, in January, right before my birthday. I moved there. I worked at the airport in Houston for a little while. Uh, and then I moved later on in the year, I moved to St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and I lived there with my brother for about a year. So half the year in Houston, half the year in St. Louis and very much, um, trying to figure out, you know, what this is, you know, I, I really look at the gap from 2014 to 2016 as, just uber, uber important and probably stretch into 2017, really right before I met you. Um, because when I met you, it kind of, 
it kind of, it, it, it went bananas because then, then I was opened up to all kinds of different genre films and all sorts of things. But during this time I, I was kind of on this journey alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was a lot of listening to podcasts and, and reading stuff and finding articles that are about what's in the race for, for the Oscars and stuff like that. And what's considered good films right now in the current and just trying to like hear other opinions. And, you know, that's when I was introduced to like Chris Ryan from the ringer, uh, and Sean Finnessy from the ringer and those guys who just, just like breathe movies. Like that's what, that's what their job is. And so I just kind of like took their advice, you know, and was like, okay, I'll see these movies or, you know, there's a, you know, Denzel Washington's and fences and you know, it's his first go at directing. Yeah. Like, let me see that, you know, uh, Hacksaw Ridge, Andrew Garfield. That's the guy who's in social network and played Spider-Man. Let me see him in this war movie. You know, you got lion. Oh, that's the guy who's in fucking Slumdog millionaire. And that's the guy who's in skins. When I used to watch that when I was younger, Manchester, Manchester by the sea just looks like an Oscar bait movie with Casey Affleck and Michelle Williams. Sign me up. You, you know, I very much had that attitude during this time of just like, I'll, I'll, I'll take in what these people are telling me because I didn't know what my true identity was with watching movies. And I think I leaned too hard on the Academy where I missed out on a lot of other 2016 films that I've seen now, but that I missed out on then because I, I, I was trying to keep up with what was happening here. Yeah. And while I do want to keep up with some of these films, of course, because I just want to see them no matter what, you know, like something like Moonlight that's A24 distributed and is an all black cast. Like, yeah, like, of course I want to see that. You know, I think a lot of people just want to see that, uh, seeing that on paper and seeing the trailer and whatnot. I, I think it's a tricky thing because, because I, I, I didn't know where to go exactly. And so I just listened to other people during this time. And that's good and bad. You know, you know what I mean? Like I got to see all these movies in theaters, these best picture nominees. I saw them on theaters and had an opinion during, during the 89th Academy Awards and went nuts when I thought La La Land was going to win. I was like, no way. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, and then of course, you know, all Warren Beatty messed up and all that stuff with Faye Dunaway on the stage. And I, <laughs> Which, by the way, I have such a different opinion about Faye Dunaway. Now I love her because <laughs> because of all the stuff we've all the stuff we've covered on this show. But but point being, man, I, I I've I've been rambling. But point being is, it's 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 very interesting to kind of look back and pinpoint when you kind of turned as a movie fan and when you decided uh, for yourself, like I'm going to start consuming this. And you know, this is right before I. I, I I met you and, you know, this stage in life of filmgasm and doing the podcast and watching a bunch of different horror films and different Oscar nominated movies and just all kinds of stuff. Trading movies with you. Uh, it's, it, it was way different. It's way different. I'm very grateful for that time, you know, 2016 and consuming these kinds of films, but I definitely missed out on stuff and I'm glad I can go back with a different lens now. Uh, and, you know, look at everything, look at it at a different lens, different, bigger scope. And, and I'm very grateful for that. And I, I think it's definitely due to filmgasm and, and just having you as a friend who very much cares about different areas of film. And, and you know, I'd, I'd venture to say that there's areas of film that I care about very much so that now you find inspiring. Yeah, absolutely, man. I've, um, when I started Filmgasm in 2014, I did it with, you know, my buddy Caleb, we did it with the mantra of watch everything. I was, you know, I'd shut myself off from a lot of different genres just because I thought they were going to be boring. A lot of decades because I thought, you know, it's going to be yeah. But with this new thing, I wanted to, I made a conscious decision to open myself up to everything. And it changed me as a movie fan. It really did. I, some, I learned, um, I, I discovered so many favorites because of this. And then when I met you, I found someone who could keep up and that was the world. Like I had somebody who understood what I was talking about. Somebody who actually like was keeping pace with me on all this crazy shit I was watching. And that's just the best, man. Really. I'm grateful too. 
Yeah, it's it's totally it's totally a language in its in itself yeah. when you're just kind of going to this world and I'm not fluent in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm always there. Uh, yeah, I you know like here, here in tech here in Texas uh you know people will come up and ask if you speak Spanish a lot of the time and it's, I'm like nah man, you know it's it's very, you know, very little <laughs> very little, you know, no español is like usually what what people will say right <laughs> and sometimes i feel that way when i'm talking about film is like i i i don't know what to say and i'm i'm okay admitting that at times yeah uh, especially yeah when we're talking about these older older decades and this big stuff that's just so grand and means so much to cinema but but here we are talking about 2016 a time we both clearly remember uh and moonlight is just uh you know just a devastating you know, brilliant on, on technical terms, brilliant, awesome performances, all, all the above. Uh, I think everyone agrees on that. I just, I just I really, really like it. And I'm really, really excited to talk about what exactly I love about it because I've started to finally figure it out after, you know, 15 watches or so. <laughs> I've, I've really started to kind of, you know, open my eyes to some of the stuff that was, wow, that, that's, that's why I dig this movie so much. And I'm excited to talk about those. Uh, but we have a proper Best Picture Showdown. And uh, we, we want to talk about some of the stuff Moonlight was up for, you know, go through the categories like we always do. But we're really, we're, we're going to be leaning on that Best Picture Showdown, talking about all these movies. We're going to go down the line. Uh, so we'll, let's go ahead and get into it, Connor. Let's start with, uh, let's, go, let's do uh, Moonlight's, you know, two other wins aside from Best Picture last. Okay. So let's let's start with uh, what would it be? F- music. Let's do music or film editing, whichever one you want. Let's go with music. It's a good place to start. All right. So we have best original score. Uh, the nominees: Jackie by Micah Levi, Lion by Dustin O'Halloran and Hauschka, Moonlight by Nicholas Bertel, Passengers by Thomas Newman, and the winner La La Land by Justin Hurwitz. The score in Moonlight is very subtle, but very powerful. And I think in any other year it would have had it, but La La Land's score is pretty grandiose and spectacular that I think it's it was impossible to beat. Yeah, already we can have a conversation that I think is just one of the ultimate, ultimate Oscar races of all time is La La Land versus Moonlight. And yeah. it's the movie... It's the movie in Hollywood about people in Los Angeles trying to make it in Los Angeles. Oh, look at that. They made it in Los Angeles. And they, and you know, da, 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 da. And like you said, it's very, it, the scale is very grand and there's lots of dancing involved and sing song. And it, it very much pays homage to old decades. And I see that now. So I see that, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's looking back at, you know, even stuff like my fair lady, it's like, you know, just kind of winking at stuff like that. And I appreciate that very, very much. So and the Academy usually sides with stuff like that. That's kind of like, you know, just kind of stroking it, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of like, Hey, Hollywood, we love you. And that's, that's fine. I think, I think La La Land is a pretty good movie. I really do. And I think Damien Giselle is just obviously a guy to just, fucking reckon with as a movie fan this guy is gonna be around yep. whiplash la la land and first man those are all three movies that have something to offer and whiplash is a masterpiece so i'm on board with damien chazelle um i think la la land has some like casting decisions that like could have been cooler but like who whatever so so many movies do justin Hurwitz, damien chazelle these guys definitely have uh, you know we they deserve a lot of praise for what they're doing um, and, and, and Nicholas Bertel, uh, for Moonlight, like you said, it's the very subtle score kind of like, you really got to be paying attention to the sounds and to really appreciate it. And it's, you know, for, for the film, it, you know, goes through three stages. So Ber- Nicholas Bertel changes the, the, the theme song just slightly for the three stages. And it's, it's very cool stuff. Very, like you said, subtle, subtlety is the best word for what's happening in Moonlight with, with the music. And it's just so cool to see two movies like that go toe to toe because they both have something to say. They both have an argument. Um, aside from those two, what do you think about the other three? Uh, do you think either any of those have a say at all? 
Well, I haven't seen Jackie, so I can't judge that one. Um, I really like the score in Lion, and I, I don't remember, the last time I saw Passengers was like three years ago. I do not remember the score. Okay, see, Passengers is a movie that I did not see in the theaters because I was like, no, nah, I reviews said it was trash, you know, so I just kind of skipped it. And then I watched it, whatever, in 2018 or something, and it's whatever. But, same, same. Yeah, it's whatever. I, it's a little bit forgettable, and the music, Thomas Newman's just a guy who's going to be nominated kind of no matter what. <laughs> I'm a huge Thomas Newman, fan, Thomas Newman fan, so I'm sure he brought something to that film. I was just, I'd, I'd need to see the film again to fully appreciate that. And it wasn't on the list this time, so, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely wasn't a Best Picture nominee, so... <laughs> You had brought up the the fact that like this year was really a battle between Moonlight and La La Land. And if you look at both of those films, they do kind of represent the old and the new of the Oscars. La La Land is the age of musicals, Hollywood stroking itself off. Moonlight is real is a real story about a real about real people and people, you know, problems people deal with on a daily basis that we don't hear about. So I think awarding Moonlight top honors was very important for the Oscars to kind of look forward. And uh, I'm glad it made the right decision. Agreed. Agreed. We'll, we'll definitely be talking a lot about that (laughs) later. Yes, indeed. Film editing. We have arrival, hell or high water, la la land, moonlight, and the winner hacksaw Ridge. Mm. Um, Mm. It's a tough one because I feel like any of these could have taken this, but hacksaw Ridge is a special one to me and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it took it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with this. I think, I think film editing is one of the categories that's hardest to judge because you'll have a very wide range of, of movies that take a different kind of, you know, different kind of hand, different kind of eye when it comes to editing and war films are just kind of in a different, different plateau it's very hard to compare something like that to a, to a La La Land or even to a Hell or High Water. Uh, Arrival, I saw it in theaters and I got to say, you know, this is, this is a, this is our boy who's going to be, or who directed Dune, Dennis. uh, I think it's Denny actually, Dennis, Denny Villeneuve. Uh, He, he did Prisoners and Enemy and so I, I went to see Arrival just like, pff, I mean, of course, you know, like I just went off of merit, like this guy's a fucking genius. <laughs> and I was a bit underwhelmed seeing it in theaters. But then I watched it again, maybe a year ago. Uh, Wolf, man, Arrival is a mind melter. And Amy Adams is like devastatingly good in it and has something to say about well, she's been nominated what six times now. Uh, yeah, she's she's had something to say a few times, and and she's she's pretty incredible on in Arrival. Uh, for for film editing, I think that's the one that has something to say. But Hexar Ridge, fair enough. Arrival is one I regrettably was not able to get back to on this watch. I couldn't get a hold of it in time. Uh, I've seen it just the one time at the movies, and I too was very underwhelmed. I saw the film based entirely off of how much I love Sicario. Hmm. So Jesus, Sicario, 2015, yeah. motherfucker, so good. <laughs> I know, right? His already in such a short time, his resume is un- unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> Den- Denny, yeah, yeah, yeah. I-, I I think he's probably if you were to like, you know, like Stanley Kubrick is the best newcomer of the 50s, right? Mm-hmm. I think I think Denny's the best newcomer of the 2010s. That that is an a very interesting discussion, but he would definitely be on the list for sure. I think he's the best guy to tackle a movie like Dune. So this is going to oh, be, cool. there is, there is nobody else. Well, and, and the fact that, that you, you see like cool, not just cool, but good actors like Timothy Chalamet and, and Zendaya, like I'm, I'm in. Yeah. I'm, I'm in when those kind of people are involved, they make, they make good decisions. And, and <laughs> usually the products that they're involved in are good. Yeah. Enough said. Uh, let's move on to cinematography. We have yeah. Arrival, uh, Bradford Young, Lion, Grieg Fraser, Moonlight, James Laxton, Silence, Rodrigo Preto, and the winner, La La Land, Linus Sangren. 
Cinematography is one of my favorite categories because it's always, I always feels like, I always feel like there's no clear winner. It's always like anybody could have this because the way the film is, you know, filmed is always so unique. And all five of these films really have a singular vision. And um, honestly, I would, as much as I did dig La La Land, I think Silence should have taken this one. Oh, man, you're not going to get a, <laughs> and I don't even like a lot that. Of, <laughs> I can get a lot of arguments here. Silence is like one of my five favorite Martin Scorsese movies. I, I love silence. Yeah. I I know you're not, not a huge fan. And I, you know, Scorsese is a very like divisive filmmaker to me, like very polarizing and very interesting person to talk about. Yeah. Cause I don't think, I don't think personally there's as many masterpieces there as most people think. Okay. But I think silence is close. I think silence uh, has a has a pretty jaw dropping story inside of it, and uh, is is you know it's it's a long long movie and you feel it you feel the length and I think that's I think that's part of the deal I think that's part of uh, the whole vibe you're supposed to feel with silence I'm not going to argue with that that'd be Rodrigo Prieto I think I think it's totally fine if if you want to say he he should win but my my vote's James Laxton like I think I think Moonlight moves like nobody's business <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with just the palette that's in front of you most of the time the color the color scheme um stuff like the color blue you know being yeah. a huge in what's happening um and obviously that there's a massive scene you know where you kind of understand why the movie's called moonlight right and that that attention to the specific color blue throughout the film when you do see that color there's like a glimpse of hope every time you see that color and then it can be taken you know taken away from you in the next scene when that color is taken away for example like when at one point uh chiron is <clears throat> bullied a little bit in school uh, and then he's in the stairwell and kind of waiting for these bullies to clear out. Uh, you see him kind of looking, looking out at these guys. And then Kevin, uh, Jarrell Jerome, comes onto the screen and starts talking to him about how he's in detention. Da da da. da. This teacher caught me fucking this girl, and uh, you know he's Jarrell Jerome is just unbelievable in this movie. Just fucking lights out. And in that moment, when he, when Kevin's character leaves and he says, before he leaves, he says, I know you can keep a secret, right? You know? And then he leaves. Then in that moment, the camera moves and then Chiron's character is in front of a background that's blue. And it's, there's like a glimpse of hope because he was just around like his crush, you know? <laughs> like fucking, he was around Kevin. Like, and he's like, gets to calm down for a second. And then a scene later, it's taken away. You know, when he gets his, when he gets beat up by Kevin, he's wearing a striped shirt that's blue and white. And so is Kevin. They're both wearing striped blue and white shirt. This attention to this stuff, like using the color scheme and using, actually using the space and the camera at the same time, for your benefit to make the movie like move as well as it does in moonlight. I, I got to go James Laxton. I think he clearly has a connection to Barry Jenkins. You know, he's worked on both moonlight and if Beale street could talk. So I just, I think they got a really cool connection and I trust both of them behind the camera the whole time. You convinced me. I think moonlight should take it too. I wasn't thinking about those things, but you're very, very uh, correct there. He really does utilize everything. That's yeah. <laughs> I th maybe someone has something to say about about La La Land because the color schemes in that are pretty wonderful as well. <laughs> you yeah, know, but it, I feel like I, I've I can't. seen it before in La La Land. Yeah, you know? that's it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, that's one of the most beautiful things about Moonlight. Right, is that not only is it a you know a film for the LGBTQ community, it's also a film that's entirely casted of black people like entirely and that dominated at the oscars like fuck you <laughs> that's awesome that's really cool it's really cool for for multiple groups of people 
that just get just get a lack of representation straight up, you know, and it's annoying. That's that's frustrating to see because like like you said, we you and I are like, yeah, we're used to La La Land. Like I can always I've been able to look at characters like uh Sebastian, like Ryan Gosling's character, forever and yeah. be like, I I can do that, you know. I've always been able to do that. And so has every other white guy for the, <laughs> for the history or the past hundred years of film. It's very cool to see a movie like Moonlight be made with this intent and this skill and you know and it succeeded it's awesome my favorite thing about moonlight is that i had never seen a story like this before no i'd never seen a story about this kind of human being ever a gay black man growing up in the projects i've never seen that story and that's why it drew me in i mean la la land is good but it's celebrating what came before it's no, it's really an ode to the age of musicals and i've seen the musicals and i'm tired of the musicals <laughs> and i've you know moonlight gave me something new and i i appreciated that above everything else hell yeah i i you know and and real quick um i think i think our, our arrival is is something that you would enjoy on a second watch and i i do think the cinematography is, is pretty pretty fucking dope in that movie it obviously operates on a technical aspect, uh, you know, to, to the nth degree. So yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I think, I think you'll dig that on a second time around. I, I definitely did as I, I was, I was pretty underwhelmed. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, there's some movies that have just completely won me over after a couple watches and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not surprised if this did, that, did it too. Let's go to director. We have Denis Villeneuve for Arrival. Mel Gibson for Hacksaw Ridge, Kenneth Lonergan for Manchester by the Sea, Barry Jenkins for Moonlight, and the winner, Damien Chazelle, for La La Land. This is interesting. Um, I always thought it was so odd that Mel Gibson found his way back to the Oscars. I'm, not a lot of people get like a second, third, fourth chance like Mel Gibson does. <laughs> yeah, not just, not just chances, but like, here you go, here's... here's nominations and, and whatnot it, it really is incredible and i i remember seeing hacksaw ridge and not really knowing at the time i thought i was just seeing another war movie yeah didn't i didn't know there was going to be this attention to detail and i didn't know andrew garfield was going to be really going for it and i didn't know melly g had it in him you know uh out of the honest oh, <laughs> I, I i did i didn't know um solid flick and are there other people that might have like worked a little harder to get there to that spot maybe but like you said melly g was on a comeback and and is still on this comeback because he's he's a total idiot sometimes yes. <laughs> and uh but 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 damn the guy has done some cool stuff here and there for film yeah i don't know nobody like nobody in my life has ever gotten so drunk they become anti-semitic but yeah. i don't yeah. you know i i don't know the whole story but i will say that mel gibson is a hell of a director he really does have an eye and hacksaw ridge is one of his best films um in terms of direction it really is well constructed the bat the, the battle scenes are unbelievable incredibly intense uh <sighs> I feel like an argument can be made for all five of these guys. Uh, they all really constructed unique films. Um, I understand why Damien Chazelle won it. You know, constructing musical is it's tough work. You got a lot of choreography to contend with, a lot of visuals, a lot of set pieces. So he was juggling quite a lot. But Barry Jenkins, I feel like, had such a streamlined bit of film here that he knew exactly what he was doing. And... Uh, I think I would give it to him. Yeah, got to be, got to be Barry. Uh, this is one of those. This is one of those where I think we're going to look back and be like, "Oh shit, they they didn't give Barry the Oscar when he made his best movie." You know, directed his best movie. Uh, I love Beale Street, but I just don't think it's anywhere near near what's going on there. Uh, like you said, this is like a total unique original vision yeah and it succeeds through and through all three parts of the movie 
And to do that kind of seamlessly. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, and a, a, a black person has never won best director. Yeah. And I think this would have been a great opportunity for representation. Uh, yeah. That's all I got to say about that. And he's, and he's the man. He, he, he is, he, he would have deserved it straight up. He's the, he's the man. He, he wears his inspirations on his sleeve. You can, you can see what he loves when you watch Moonlight, when you watch Beale Street. Oh man, this guy loves movies. Like you can totally tell this guy's a sucker for, for film. He's just a fan and he wants to convey, con- convey these awesome stories. And, and I, you know, I, I think people should just be grateful for, for Barry. And it, it certainly would have been cool for representation's sake and just because he's the man that, uh, you know, for him to win this award. Because yeah. he would have been, he, he would have been just as elated as, you know, Bong Joon-ho, for sure. For those of you who are wondering what Barry's up to next, by the way, he's working on a uh, Underground Railroad TV show. And you. he's doing a prequel to the live-action Lion King movie. So, interesting combo there. Very, very interesting. I, I much prefer him doing stuff that's a little more, <laughs> a little more uh, at, at the heart. But uh, hey, it's all right. We'll see. We'll see. What, we'll see what happens. I also want him to get his money. You know, doesn't matter how much of an indie filmmaker you are, how personal your films are. Everybody bows to the House of Mouse. <laughs> yep, Disney baby. Yeah. Uh, just, I feel like people do it just so they can say, I made a Disney movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Best Supporting Actress. This is a very good group here. We have oh yeah, Naomi Harris for Moonlight, Nicole Kidman for Lion, Octavia Spencer for Hidden Figures, Michelle Williams for Manchester by the Sea, and the winner, Viola Davis for Fences. Ooh. Well, I've seen all five of these, so finally I can talk about about one of these acting categories in its entirety, which is nice. It's the beauty of doing 2016 movies, yeah. Yeah, yes, indeed. So, oh, all right. Naomi Harris in Moonlight, considering she had maybe three, like three, four days to film, uh, this is unbelievable, <laughs> what she was able to do with no prep and no time. It's an incredible performance. Uh, Nicole Kidman in Lion. Good. Not necessarily Oscar worthy, I don't think. I don't think she really stands out in that movie. I think she's a good character, but she doesn't really bring anything to the awards table for me. Uh, N- N- Nicole Nicole will get nominated. I love her. Love Nicole Kidman. But she will get nominated for doing less than stuff for even her, you know, for her potential. Yeah. Whereas these other four, oof, like they all have a case. All four of them have a case. Uh, but, but yeah, I think Nicole's the odd one out here. I think she's the first to go if you, if you had to. Yeah. Octavia Spencer and hidden figures is good, but it really should have been Taraji P Henson who got nominated. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Uh, Michelle Williams, Manchester by the Sea. She is just one of those actresses. I feel like she's going to be like Peter O'Toole. Constantly great, never gets hers. Yeah, Michelle Williams, I think people don't realize. I, I think she's like one of the top five working actresses right now as far as talent. Yeah. Like if I were making a movie, I would I would write a character for her. She's devastating and like gorgeous and can on a dime just change all of her emotions you know and i i really adore everything i've seen her in yeah uh even if the, even if i don't love the film even like manchester by the sea i don't i don't love that movie but when she's on the screen there's just there's nowhere else i want to be so having said all that about these four viola davis 100 <laughs> deserve this win her role in fences is unreal phenomenal and i'm so glad she took home the gold so yeah this doesn't really have a contest for me (laughs) that's that's fair i i think i think naomi is is closer is is closer than you think uh mainly because of the circumstance and that lady's british (laughs) 
I know it's <laughs> insane. Oh, uh, she, 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 she plays South Southern, you know, like a woman in the South in America. And she, you know, throughout the whole film goes through this roller coaster, but just right at the beginning when she starts talking, right. When she comes around the corner to see Juan and, and little just standing there and she's like, you know, where was you, you know, just like right away. And I was like, Holy shit. That's Naomi here. Yeah. <laughs> that's the chick from 28 days later. Stop, you know, like stop. And just blew, blew me away. She's an incredible character actor. Every time uh, she, yeah. comes, she disappears, I, I can't believe she's Calypso in the Pirates yeah. movie. She's yes. Like, like how yeah. is this the same woman? <laughs> ah, yeah. fucking, fucking Bond. Yeah, but, but, but like you said, Viola Davis is, I mean, there, there's a few specific moments where she, it's like, oh, that, yeah. this might be the best, this might be the best performance of the decade. Like, she's, she's totally, she's totally crushing it and she knocks she just knocks shit out of the park if you give her any like any slack viola davis is like okay (laughs) and and just and just destroys it like um i think an even better example than fences is what she doing it what she does in doubt for like four minutes just like boom just punches you in the face over and over and over and then it's gone and that's it it's like the best part of the whole movie unbelievable she brings that same talent and gusto to commercial films too. She's one uh, of the yeah. bits of Suicide Squad I enjoyed. Like, yeah, he's perfectly cast as Amanda Waller, and I wish she'd had more time to shine because she really is the best, like one of the best parts of that movie. And I'm just, you know, I wish her all the success in the world. I loved her in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Like, she's just one of the best working today, one of the best actresses. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad she has a statue. Academy Award winner Viola Davis. It sounds good. Yeah, and her her speech is just it's just what you would expect, you know, when she <laughs> wins this. She just looks unbelievable in, in this awesome red dress. And she talks about how we're all gonna meet in the graveyard one day. It's fucking awesome. And Viola Davis just, just lays the smack down and you just listen. When she talks in real life or on the screen, you fucking listen. Hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah, man. So let's get into the awards that Moonlight did win. Um, it took home three. First of all, best supporting actor. We have Jeff Bridges for Hell or High Water, Lucas Hedges for Manchester by the Sea, Dev Patel for Lion, Michael Shannon for Nocturnal Animals, and the winner, Mahershala Ali for Moonlight. Ooh, this is a good cat. This is a good bunch of actors here. My God. Although I don't get why Dev Patel was not up for best actor. I mean, it's his, it's his story. <laughs> yeah, that one's, that one's tough, but I do love this range of actors we have here. You know, you got the, the old dog, Jeff Bridges, who just has been around forever. He's got seven nominations all together in his lifetime. And you got Mahersh Ali, who's a, who's like in the same boat as Christoph Waltz. He's a bang, bang, two-time nominated, two-time winner. You got Dev Patel, first time in there. Lucas Hedges, first time in there. And Michael Shannon, who's just like super underrated, super, super underrated. And is a guy that you and I are kind of a sucker for. Yeah. And let's go ahead and talk about that performance first. Cause I think it definitely, I think he definitely has something to say. He okay. he's, he's my favorite part of nocturnal animals. And I think he's, he's doing Michael Shannon's doing exactly what, the Academy loves on a supporting actor to do. Uh, they've awarded so many characters like that in the past. And uh, I, I do think he deserved that nomination. Yeah. Nocturnal animals is a film that is so disturbing and so underrated. And I think this was its only nomination. It, uh, it very well might be. Yeah. I yeah, the movies. Awesome. <laughs> it's such a cool um, idea. It's got so many, so many amazing performances. Um, yeah, just the one nomination. Wow. Uh, Crazy. <laughs> insane. But Michael Shannon earns it. His his performance is so on the line. Like, you feel like he could snap at any moment. He's just this impossibly insane sheriff who's willing to do whatever it takes. And uh, Or not sheriff, detective. But, um, 
Yeah, I think I wish that movie had gotten more love. I mean, this was a very loaded year, but I wish Nocturnal Animals had gotten some more love. Yeah, it's definitely the one of all the films that are kind of there, but not there. You know, kind of like Lighthouse last year is like, ah, you fuckers. Y'all didn't really pay attention to Lighthouse. You kind of did, but you didn't really. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about Nocturnal Animals. It's definitely in that in that boat of like wait a minute i think this movie is actually really really good <laughs> and and they missed out on it in the in the moment well i remember it, it was weird that aaron taylor johnson was nominated for the globe he won the globe and then it was michael shannon who got the oscar nomination it's, it's weird when that happens the globes the globes have a way of doing that you know i mean bill murray was nominated for a golden globe for his performance in rushmore they they just they tend to think differently than the Oscars from time to time. <laughs> true, very true. Can you imagine if, <laughs> if Bill Murray were up for a, a Wes Anderson role? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. The rest of these guys, Jeff Bridges, I love him to death, but I feel like he is just playing Jeff Bridges in Hell or High Water. He's modern day Rooster Cogburn here, but I don't care because I love that. Ah, hell, hell or high water. Haven't really got to talk about that yet. I, oh boy, love hell or high water. It's super Texan. Oh yeah, super gritty. Uh, my mother and her side of the family, they're most of them are from post Texas, and that's where the end of the film is in hell or high water. And <laughs> I've, I've, I've been to, I've, I've, I've driven past that bank and definitely recognize the areas they're in because post is very small. <laughs> it's a very small town and hell or high water just kind of is a movie that just pierces right through my heart. It's like, yep. Uh, I'll pretty much watch anything where there's, you know, high production and you got a couple, couple Texas dudes just robbing shit. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> fucking a, you know, I'll, I'll watch that all day. And so I feel a little bit biased towards that movie, almost like I'm just I'm just on its side. But it is a good movie, you know. I have removed I have removed that kind of like that bias because I've seen it a few times now, and it's not as good as I thought it was when I saw it in theaters. When I saw it in theaters, I was like, "Oh, this could be this could win," you know. <laughs> and 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 I don't think that now, yeah. but I still I still do think it's a solid movie and it's really entertaining. You know, right from right from the get go, you know, there's there's some some really good good directing there as they're they're, you know, in the car and they're leaving. Hey, early bird gets the worm, <laughs> little brother. You know, you got you got Chris Pine in a really interesting role. I wish he I wish he did more stuff like that. Ben Foster is just that guy's unpredictable as hell. Ben Foster is fucking fantastic. He's just. Nobody ever talks about him, but that guy delivers every time. Even in the shitty, like, low-budget, you know, Bruce Willis action thrillers, he's still awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I am talking about Hostage, by the way, for those of you yeah. following this. But um, as far as Hell or High Water winning, like, we already got our Texas crime thriller best picture win. Can't expect the same luck twice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> uh, Lucas Hedges in Manchester by the Sea. I'm not. I, I was not really a big fan of that movie. I thought it was very dull. Um, I don't think Casey Affleck should have taken actor for that. Lucas Hedges, on the other hand, is a very, is an immense talent who is just starting, and his his journey already has been amazing. And I, I'm looking forward to a very long career of this kid just growing into a powerhouse. Oh boy. Yeah. Ah, uh, boy. Lucas Hedges, I think first off, he's younger than both of us. Uh, pr pretty wild to think the, the films he's been involved with just, he, he he's just chosen things that it's like, he's got a bunch of data from my mind and he's like, Oh, I'll just advertise towards Austin, you know? And like, I, I'm okay with admit, I'm okay with admitting that I can be read like a book, you know, like he's in, you know, Lady Bird and mid nineties and three billboards, you know, and this Manchester by the sea. And, you know, um, for, for fuck's sake, he's in Moonrise Kingdom, uh, Boy Erased, 
Uh, ben is back. I love this guy. Like, uh, fucking waves. Good God, he's amazing in waves. Oh, my Lord. I, I think he should have been nominated for waves. I think everybody should have been nominated <laughs> in waves. Um, especially Sterling K. Brown. Holy hell. I Lucas Hedges is, is, is the man to look out for. I think a lot of people have their, their eyes fixed on Timothy Chalamet as the next it, as the next guy. I'm, I'm pulling I, I'm, my money's on Lucas as the guy who's going to have the, the longer and better career. Um, he, he clearly has, has, has an eye for making just awesome decisions already. You know, he's 24 years old. He just turned 24 for, yeah, this guy, this is nuts. You know, this guy, what he's, what he's been able to do. It's definitely, definitely my favorite guy. Who's, you know, in his early twenties. Um, yeah, Lucas. Lucas Hedges, guy to look out for. I agree with you. I think Manchester by the Sea is a little a, a bit dull. I, I do I do enjoy movies like that, but I think it's trying too hard to be a movie like that. If you know what I mean, you know what yes. I'm saying. Yes. Um, you, not everybody's you know, not every movie is going to be Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain, where it's like, oh, each tender moment just makes total sense, you know, and totally pays off and totally works. I think Manchester by the Sea at times is trying too hard to be that kind of a movie that is like the slow, the slow burner that's just kind of hitting you hard over and over. I, I think it could have benefited from kind of changing pace every now and again uh, as a film overall. But Lucas Edges is great. Yeah. Dev Patel in Lion. Uh, that's the most recent film I watched of these, like of these uh, Best Picture nominees. Lion is the one I watched like two weeks ago. That's the most recent first time watch. And I was very uh, enthralled by it. I was very, especially when I found out it was a true story. Uh, what a heartwarming story of hope. And Dev Patel really delivers that so well. I, everything I've seen him in, I have been very impressed with. And uh, yeah, I'm very glad uh, I got to watch this one. I do think he should have been up for best actor. But I get, you know, since the first half of the movie is uh, Saru as a child, why he was up for supporting, I get it. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. I, I, I understand, especially when you look at the group uh, of Denzel Washington, Viggo Mortensen, Ryan Gosling, Andrew Garfield, and Casey Affleck. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Hard competition up there, yeah. <laughs> and and I, you know, I, I just, I, I think... I think Viggo Mortensen should have won that noise over there uh, in Best Actor. He is unbelievable in Captain Fantastic and is the reason that movie is what it is. Uh, yeah, he's Viggo's, Viggo's fucking great in that movie. I haven't seen Captain Fantastic. Yeah, God, look out, dude. You're just going to be, you're going to be like, Viggo, no, you know, he, he's, he's, you know, it's Aragorn as a father, you know, just, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it, it kind of blew my mind. And kept Fantastic as a movie that I saw. I actually saw it in Chicago. Um, I saw that and Jason Bourne, that kind of shitty movie from 2016. Yeah. I saw, I saw both of those in Chicago. Uh, I was there during the summer um, and it was right before I moved to St. Louis and my dad was with me and my older brother. And we us three saw Captain Fantastic like right before my dad left us to you know come back to Texas and he's like all right you know he, like he was just hanging out with us basically when we went to Chicago it was dope it was a lot of fun <laughs> but that movie in that moment specifically kind of just shattered all of us and so I have a very fond memory of it uh, I've only seen it again since then maybe a couple times but uh it's a tearjerker for sure. And I don't think it should have been up for best picture, but I, I do love it. It's definitely a movie kind of like up, up, up our alley, just kind of a, a heartwarming movie with Vigo at the center. Yeah. Very. Yeah. I think you'll really like it. Good to know. Very good to know. Uh, so that brings us to Mahershala as Juan. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, doubt in your mind who should have gotten this Oscar. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I Mahershala is amazing. Uh, I love how fast he kind of just came out of nowhere to become like one of the most sought after character actors Two yeah. like two back to back wins is amazing. And he also is, you know, fairly young. He's 
He's going to be Blade. <laughs> I mean, oh, come on. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, I love this guy to death. He's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite parts of House of Cards. Yes. Uh, and yeah, everything I see this guy in, he's just like, you fucking cotton mouth. I mean, that alone was scary. Like <laughs> his character in Luke Cage was fucking scary. Yes. He's the best part of that shit. Mm. Yeah. I can talk <laughs> yeah. about this guy all day and I really am so happy he got both awards. I think he's amazing in Green Book too, but that's a conversation for later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's very good in Green Book. But yeah, it's definitely. I, I don't think people are as fond of that win as they are for his character as Juan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and this this is probably my you know as a fan this is probably my favorite supporting actor role i've ever seen uh, for for me you know i i wrote about this maybe a year ago uh, i talked about how you know I'm, I'm really really into what jk simmons is doing in in whiplash um which are the ones uh obviously i'm very into what heath ledger is doing in the dark knight um i can't i can't think of others off the top of my head uh, I've, got your, I've got your top five right here. If you want me to ring them off for you, well, go go for it. <laughs> All right, number five, Christoph Waltz and Glorious Bastards. Yes. Number four, Javier in No Country for Old Men. Yes. Number three, Heath Ledger, The Dark Knight. Number two, J.K. Simmons, Whiplash. Number one, Mahershala Ali, Moonlight. Okay, so yeah, it's just the past twenty years. Uh, obviously, there's not a lot of shout outs to to older stuff. Um, that's the work I have to do, you know, to get really familiar with those. For for me, what I know and well, all I've seen, I just, I won, like, well, I, I, I don't need any more. It's a very much less is more role. And the way his character is written to me is just pure genius. And the way they kind of use him once he's not there anymore, the way they kind of use Juan still yeah, is, is only, they can only do that because Mahershala Ali was so fucking good while he was there. He, right from the get go, when you hear Boris Gardner, um, the, the title of the track, Every Blank is a Star, it's a song that Kendrick Lamar sampled for To Pimp a Butterfly. Beautiful track. <clears throat> when you hear that open and the little A24 logo pops up, and then Mahershala Ali gets out of the car and he's, you know, just the way he's smoking the cigarette, the way he starts talking to his boy, and the camera is spinning around him, you're like, this guy, I. I don't know where else to look like he's, he's kind of it the same way, the same way Heath Ledger was that way. Like this guy's it, this guy's it on the screen. And when he's having the conversations with Chiron with little, it's like, man, how, how wonderful it would be for, for kids to have a, have a dude like that to just talk to. Holy shit. This guy's listening. And teaching him how to swim those those little moments are like so beautiful and speak so much to his character even though he's not there that much on the, in, in the movie his screen time is very little doesn't have a ton of lines but it is it is so impactful that the, those moments that he's there and uh he he's a really good chemistry with you know Janelle Monet and you know uh Alex Ebert these 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 different actors, I, I, I very much love what he's doing in Moonlight. It's probably the first thing I fell in love with when I first saw it. I was like, damn, like, Marsha Lee, this guy, <laughs> look out, this guy's coming, you know, and he's, this guy's a good actor. And, you know, when his character's not there anymore, I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but, but as I rewatch it and rewatch it, it's so necessary for the story to hit like it does. And the way they still use him is, is very cool. Very cool. Very good writing. Incredibly. And I love how, you know, again, this film is built around people, you not know, real people. And how he is, you know, a caring father figure for little, but also he's a he's a drug dealer. Yes. He's, he's a ruthless drug dealer on that side of his life. People are black are, you know, they're not black and white. It's gray. We are all different pieces. And I love how this film approaches that. You can be yeah. a good person and also do what you have to do to survive in this kind of you know world. He's the perfect nexus of both sides. 
a hundred percent. I, yeah. Love, I love characters like that in general, you know, like those are cool characters to have in movies, like, you know, a, a drug dealer who takes someone under their wing and is like, we love characters like that in general, but when you have it under these circumstances in Liberty city in Miami, Florida with, you know, in the projects and, you know, something that Barry Jenkins said, uh, says about this movie is that they brought the art house to the hood. <laughs> and like, I love that. I love that quote. And you like, you see that through and through, you know, and, and Mahershala Ali is definitely kind of like the through line of that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and his character itself, like you said, is it's super great. It's like the definition of great and fans love that no matter what. And yeah. when you put it in, when you put it into this environment, it's just very, very powerful and has the chance to be, yeah, be something really special, which is what it is. I mean, the, the scene when he, when he's asked, when Juan is asked, you know, what does the word faggot mean? And he's like, he tells the kids straight up, like, it's a word that tries, you know, it's people that want to make gay people feel bad. That's what that word is. It's going to be honest with you. Don't let anybody call you that, man. Like, it's cool. Like, you can be what you want to be, but you don't got to let people call you names. I love that. I love that. The little seeds of confidence that he's, he instills in, in Chiron um, that he obviously needs. Ah, man. Yeah. <laughs> really good character. Well, also in that scene, Chiron asks him, do you sell drugs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want I don't I, I don't want to spoil too much because I don't know which scene you know what you've chosen for your awards. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you ah. know, uh, we're we're gonna get to the best picture talk here soon, and then we'll have our awards after that. Mm. Uh, bear with us; we're having fun. Just the, the Moonlight's a great movie, and there's some great movies around it. Yeah, well, that whole like the, that scene, and then the scene where Juan sees Paula smoking crack in the car. Oh. Those oh. are the scenes that got him the Oscar for sure, because yeah. like his restraint. He, he wants to freak out on her, but he knows it's not his kid. He has no right. He knows he can't do anything, but he, God, you know, he wants to. It's Ugh. perfect. Ah, moving on. <laughs> I really, you know, I said I could talk about him all day and I wasn't lying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same man. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. His do rag, his air force ones, the Marlboro special blends, like every little thing about Juan is like, Fuck, this guy's awesome. <laughs> the do rag that Chiron wait, later wears himself, like yes. cyclical. God damn, All right. Chiron totally built, totally builds his yeah. his his. You know, the identity kind of, of black yeah. is Juan. Yes. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, best adapted screenplay. We have Arrival by Eric Heiserer, Fences by August Wilson, posthumously uh, based on his play. Hidden Figures by Allison Schroeder and Theodore Melfi. Lion by Luke Davis. And the winner, Moonlight by Barry Jenkins. And yeah, I mean, no contest here. This was for sure taking screenplay. And yeah. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Perfect. Incredible stuff. You know, this is, uh, yeah, Terrell Alvin McCraney. This is this is the guy who's, who's really, really, really at the heart of the story here and wrote the play. You know, in Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue. And of course, again, that's another scene with Mahershala Ali as Juan when he's kind of doing that accent, that Cuban accent. Yeah. The fuck, Mahershala Ali? Like, <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you doing that accent? Just, just like bad enough to make it, yeah, like that's totally believable that just some guy would just do that out of nowhere. Uh, just talking to this 12-year-old. It's, re- it's really, really amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, man, n- no arguments here, I think. <laughs> I think this screenplay is like a fucking diamond. It is. It really is. And all of these films are, apart from, in my opinion, Arrival, well-written. Fences, Hidden Figures, and Lion, all three very well-written films. Fences, yeah, well, I don't yeah. think, counts because the screenplay is the play. Yeah, that one's, that one's tough. That, one, that one's tough. And, you know, August Wilson, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So maybe, yeah, we'll, see another, maybe we'll see another nomination uh, in April. Well, yes, because it was tooled with, like, you know, toyed with a little to fit the screen. In this case, it literally is just stage to screen, no change. It's like, you know, Shakespeare getting nominated for a Hamlet adaptation. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm not saying August Wilson's a bad writer by any stretch of the imagination. No, no, no. Amazing writer. But I do think that 
this is it's odd for that to happen. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So moonlight for sure. <laughs> that takes us to best picture. We have Arrival, Fences, Hacksaw Ridge, Hell or High Water, Hidden Figures, La La Land, Lion, Manchester by the Sea, and the winner, of course, Moonlight. Regrettably, this awards is mostly known for the massive fuck-up where they announced the wrong film. La La Land had its brief moment in the spotlight before they announced, oh, by the way, we lost, and the Moonlight producers got to speak. Oh, it, the most awkward fuck-up in Oscar history, you think? Yeah, well, especially in the day and age. You know, if this is, like, super old and there's not a bunch of cameras on and all this going on. But yeah. it's, you know, yeah, it's this this happened in 2017 at the 89th Academy Awards with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, two of, you know, Hollywood's titans of, you know, the 60s and 70s and two people that you and I have gotten to kind of, you know, you know, research and study and see some of their performances through, through this show. And uh, for sure, man, for sure, man, it's considering the circumstances and especially considering the fact that it took them that long to fix it. I mean, everyone was on stage. Like there were like three speeches in to the best picture speech. This guy's like, Oh, I just want to thank my mom. Da, 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 da. Oh, by the way, we lost, you know, and it's just a shit show uh, until it's a shit show until Barry Jenkins takes the microphone. And you, you just forget, you forget everything that happened and you're like, oh yeah, that guy won. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and you know, he, he, he just kind of looks like he belongs there. Barry Jenkins totally belonged there and deserves that fucking statue. Well, now that we got that unpleasantness out of the way, let's take these films one at a time. Let's do it. Arrival. Uh, Amy Adams plays a linguist who is brought in to investigate a alien ship that has shown up and uh, she's there to communicate with these beings. And along the way, she learned some things about herself, and there's some time travel, and it got really weird towards the middle. Uh, yeah, Not a fan of this one, admittedly, but like you said, you benefited from a second watch. I probably will, too. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think that's always good, you know, especially with um, movies you see in theaters, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you have a certain expectation uh, sometimes, and then watch when you sit and watch it at home and you're allowed to, you know, just pause it, take a piss and, you know, just kind of relax and see it for what it is. Sometimes that can help it or hurt it. Uh, I, I love rewatching movies in that way. Yeah, of course. Certain movies. There's some movies I like are one and done like that does not deserve a second chance, but that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, no. Fences. A working class African-American father struggles to raise his family while on the verge of losing them due to his own infidelity and insecurities. Denzel Washington uh, direct. I don't think this was his directorial debut, but it was his uh, a big one for him. And uh, yeah, I thought this film was really good. I watched this for the first time back in December, uh, just on a whim. And hell yeah, I was blown away. He's such a bastard in this movie. Denzel Washington, his character is such a horrible human being. And yeah, it's just it's a great one. It's a great snapshot into this time period and just a life of a family about to fall apart. Yeah, for sure. I think at times you can see, you can very much see through that it is a play. Yeah. But overall, but overall super impactful. And at the heart of it has, yeah, just kind of hall of fame type performances uh, from, from Denzel and Viola and to see them two together is in itself a treat. True. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Fences is awesome, and I don't think it ever had a chance of winning the whole thing, but it but it had a horse. You know, it's funny people kind of use the phrase, you know, you can tell it was a play in like the negative. That's never bothered me because I love dialogue heavy films anyway, so I've never really seen that as a problem. Yeah, that, no, that's that's fair. I I, I think. In some cases, it works for it. In some cases, against it. Just like uh, for for another kind of movie. In some cases, it works to to use you know, like for Aaron Sorkin. Sometimes it works to use the court, and sometimes it doesn't. You know, and I, I think it can be for the same way. And for fences, it works. I think. Yeah. 
Hacksaw Ridge, uh, biopic, true story of Desmond Doss, a conscientious objector who joined the army uh, in World War II to be a medic. He did not believe in violence. He did not believe in carrying a weapon. He did not carry a weapon. Ended up saving the lives of over 40 men in uh, Japan. Was given the Medal of Honor. One of the most decorated soldiers in the World War II and a true, true hero, in my opinion. And this movie is his story and it is phenomenal. It is the only nine I gave of this group. And I stand by that. To me, and I know this is going to hurt you, this would be my pick for best picture. Hacksaw Ridge. That's the only nine you give. Yes. Fair enough. Most of these are eights for me. Uh, and then, of course, Moonlight's just like a 11 or whatever you know, <laughs> type, yeah. type deal. Um, well, I think... Yeah, I think they're pretty much eights across the board other than that. I gave Arrival a seven, and I gave Manchester by the Sea a seven. Uh, fair enough. That's else, fair. Everything else was an eight, and then uh, Hacksaw was a nine. But Hacksaw was only a nine on the second watch. There you go. Fair. I, I like that. I like that second watch. Uh, can I give you my, my, my one <laughs> nitpick yeah. with Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah, of course. That I've... I honestly didn't notice the first time I watched it because I think I'm a little desensitized when watching war movies, but then, you know, watching again and uh, a friend of mine pointed something out to me. It was, uh, you know, there's some scenes where folks are getting, you know, blown up or what have you. And I don't like the way some of those are filmed like in slow motion. And then there's a score where it's like, we're watching Lord of the Rings or something. And I, I didn't think it matched well in Hacksaw Ridge um, in those moments. And for that reason is why I, I don't think I had a chance. I, I think like there's decisions that were made for Hacksaw Ridge that I don't, that I don't think were, were the right ones. And I don't know if that's Mel Gibson's call or I, I, I don't know who, you know, was in charge of that exact stuff. I, I, I found some of the actual battle sequences to be kind of like, whoa. I, Gratuitous? That, yeah, yeah yeah i understand that i mean look at mel gibson's filmography as a director you've got braveheart passion yeah. of christ axel ridge that dude goes hard on blood and gore yeah and to me you know being a horror fan i'm incredibly desensitized to blood and gore so i don't really pay attention to that at this point i was for me it's more i love the story of desmond doss he was a uh, american hero i never knew about Yes. Uh, Andrew Garfield's performance was fantastic. I loved Hugo Weaving's performance. I wish he'd been up for Best Supporting Actor. Uh, Vince Vaughn, I thought was great. Sam Worthington, I thought was great. And I loved that Mel Gibson told this story. And yeah, I just, I, I thought it was a very compelling and inspirational uh, war epic. And I knew it didn't have a chance at winning, but I had, you know, I, I still was champion in it. But I understand I why it would, it would, some people can think it was gratuitous. I get, I understand that. It, it's, it's not. That's not really an issue. It's more how that is, um, how it's portrayed. You know, I, I gave Itchy the Killer a ten. You know, <laughs> I love, I love some nasty, some nastiness in a movie. So, do you think but, like there's a time and a place that kind of thing? I think there's a a, a way to present it, and. In Hacksaw Ridge, there was just times where it was like matched up with some music, maybe that was like, hmm, I don't know about this. You know, people's pe- people are just getting blown up, and I'm I'm more like a um, in the middle stance on war movies, where it's like not taking sides. Hacksaw Ridge, and I think Mel Gibson at times takes sides. Yeah, I I do understand that war movies are incredibly they're tough. Propa- they're propaganda, basically. Yeah, they're tough. They're tough. I get that. It's really tough to be middle ground on tour- on war movies, especially when you have a war like World War II, which was pretty yeah. damn decisively good versus evil. Correct. Uh, I understand. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, and, and I, I actually think Hacksaw Ridge, 20 years prior to this, has a huge, great chance of winning. I, I, I really do. I think there's a... You mentioned earlier 
how at this time the academy is trying to like make some changes even like consciously like oh they might even do things that they don't want to do but they just do it for representation's sake or whatever um and i think that's you know a big reason why moonlight one was they realized they need to do something and this is a chance to do it to vote for a real movie that was really good that has this representation yeah but all these other ones here they all have a they, they all have a place and in any other year they also have a place and Hacksaw Ridge is in that is in that category. Is in 2010, I think it would have been up for Best Picture. In 1995, I think it would have been up for Best Picture. Yeah, uh, I think it's a solid movie. But for it to win, I think those like little things are the things that make the difference. Like uh, uh, an example would be like 2009. I think Inglorious Bastards certainly has a case for winning Best Picture that year. Yeah. Because, because I don't, I, I see it as this pretty, you, you know, multifaceted, multi-perspective movie that's just like, whoa, oh my God. Like the lengths, the lengths that this crew went to in that movie to kind of capture everything. I think, I think there are a lot of more recent war movies that don't go that extra mile, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I get it. A lot of war movies have to take a side because you know they're playing to one specific audience and in america we're told we're the we're the heroes we're the good guys we've always been the good guys so to take you know to take a different perspective is kind of risky and uh that's why i like war movies from other countries because you get to see that other side of things like downfall for instance one of my favorites the story of you know hitler's last days in the bunker as he realized the war was ending and he wasn't going to win it amazing (laughs) So you do need, you know, multiple perspectives to fully appreciate something as giant scale as World War II. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I get that. It's funny how you mentioned Moonlight winning Best Picture as a way for the Oscars to champion representation. And then they followed it with a fish sex movie and a white savior movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, exactly, exactly. It's like they're like, here, they got their one, you know, so people can shut up. And they're like, let's go back to making really weird choices. <laughs> oh. and, then, and, then, and then we got Parasite. And now we're going to have maybe two more years of shit. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this year, I, we've seen everything that could be up for Oscars. So I, I don't think there's anything that really stands out as like a shit movie that's going to steal it. No, no. In, in Shape of Water and Green Book are not shit movies. That I'm just, I'm, I'm poking at them. Uh, no. I just don't think, I, I don't think they're anywhere near moonlight and parasite on the other side of (laughs) of course uh hidden figures this was kind of the dark horse this is one i didn't expect to see up for best picture Uh, i thought it was really good i just didn't think it was going to be content uh, a contender and it's a true story of uh katherine johnson a black woman who joined nasa and was a mathematical genius who helped develop the mathematical formulas necessary to send a man into space yeah and uh she it's a very infuriating movie any film that deals with segregation is infuriating uh but also this film is very inspirational and uh i learned a lot about a figure who was essential to winning the space race and a a, 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 a woman i've never heard of and it sucks how you know people have been written out of the history books simply because of the color of their skin and, and I'm glad we're yeah. getting to reclaim these people in films like this. Yeah, and isn't it nice to just see people who look different wearing these kind of clothes in this kind of a movie with this with this kind of a budget? I I I was just kind of refreshed the entire time while watching Hidden Figures. I was like, oh, normally that's Nicole Kidman, Meryl Streep, and Sandra Bullock. You know what I mean? And a movie like this, Hidden Figures, to to what? really to really make this movie, I think is, I think it shows that we're in a special time, and I think more stories like this need to need to be told. I think Hidden Figures and Moonlight are are definitely two movies that are very important in the in the um, in the in the long run, uh, yeah. and when it comes to when it comes to the greater the bigger picture of cinema. I think those two movies are, are very important for representation and for storytelling and 
you know, being a voice for the voiceless, I think, I think those are huge movies. Saddest thing is that if this film had been made in the eighties, I guarantee you these three women would have been played by white women. Yeah, no. Yeah. Maybe even just 10 years ago, you know, like really it, it, we have changed. We have changed a, a lot and, and, you know, it should, should have gone quicker, but yeah, we, we, we want more movies like this. And when they do well and they're, you know, receive accolades and get recognized, that's very exciting. Well, I'm glad that Katherine Johnson got to see this film before she passed away. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed this film a lot. I thought Taraji P. Henson should have been up for Best Actress. And I thought all uh, Octavia Spencer and Janelle Monae were both fantastic as well. And this was a very a year. good story. What a year for Janelle. Yeah. <laughs> Hell or High Water. So the most Texas yeehaw movie we got on this list. It's uh, about two brothers who start a bank robbing spree in order to save their family ranch, but end up drawing the eye of a Texas Ranger on the eve of retirement. It's Chris Pine, Ben Foster, and Jeff Bridges. And it's fucking awesome. Uh, yeah, this movie's very cool. It's almost like a farewell to the Western. And uh, yeah, it's just a very engaging thriller that... Never really had a chance at winning Best Picture, but it's awesome to see a purely Texas film get represented. Yeah, I really all I need is 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 this, Hell or <laughs> High Water. Hell or High Water is a 2016 American neo western heist film. I, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neo neo western heist. Uh, <laughs> like. Can we just have, can we have one of those per year? Like, you know, people get fucking Star Wars every year. Can I get my neo-Western heist film every year? Jesus. Oh, man. No kidding. Kind of like a, you know, an homage, a goodbye to movies like this. These just don't get made enough. They just simply do not. Movies that have good chases in them. Movies that have one-on-one fucking gunplay and bank robberies and gambling. Yeah, I, I'll watch this all day. This is, this and you know, two guys like rounders. Just give me more movies like that. Just two guys just fucking around. Yeah, you know there hasn't been a really really good western in a long time. It's a genre that I think is like barely has any breath left in it. I'd love to see somebody you know revitalize it. I thought Hostels was okay, and I thought. 2007's 310 to Yuma was pretty damn good. 310 to Yuma rocked. Django Unchained rocked. Uh, True Django, Grit, yeah. Great. Django, it, it's a Western. I know, I, yeah. But it's like, it's Tarantino. You know what I mean? It's like... Yeah, he's his own genre. I, I understand. This guy, this guy brings, brings his own thing. I want Hollywood to make shit like Hell or High Water. I want... I, I I want stuff like this every year, not every fucking six years, you know. And yeah. it's it's frustrating as hell because I I love I love a good you know intense quality you know action movie that's got got intent behind it that's but has a pace to it, and that's Heller High Water <laughs> has, has no chance of beating you know winning this award yeah. best picture, but it, like you said, I love to see it in there. The last really good Western, I think, that was re- like that was mainstream released, I think, was 2018's The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was, you know, really creative. It was like five different Westerns in one. Leave it to the Coen brothers to make the last two, two great Westerns. No, Buster Scruggs and True Grit. True Grit is very good. I do, I do really like True Grit. I, again, Hell or High Water, I like that it's like an original idea and just kind of is it is what it is yeah that's i love that moving on to la la land the you know the other the network to moonlight's rocky so to speak well the top the top dog yeah the, the, the top dog i mean la la land had 14 nominations altogether at this this show i just dominance pure dominance took home six um basically a struggling jazz pianist and an aspiring actress meet in Hollywood and fall in love and try to fulfill their respective dreams only to realize their dreams are pulling them in different directions. It's Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, Damon Chazelle's third movie, I think. Second, first man would be the third. 
Okay. Whiplash. Whiplash was his first official. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Damn, for part two. Good job, Damien. No, he... <laughs> yeah, for as much shit as, like, La La Land gets, I'm not in that boat. I, I hope people don't read me that way. I think La La Land it has a lot to offer. And I, th- I, think, I think mainly that's Damien Giselle, man. This guy is, like, 39... 38, 39, somewhere in there. I'm like, yeah. fuck. Like, I, I, w- I, w- I want to witness this. If a guy makes Whiplash, and I see that as, you know, like a through and through masterpiece that should have beat Birdman um, from 2014. I just love that movie. And if La La Land's not perfect, his second movie to that, his follow up, I'll be okay. <laughs> people, people need to calm down. Also, First Man is really, really good. So he came back. And made a movie that I, I think it goes Whiplash number one, First Man, and then La La Land. I think that's the that's my ranking of those three movies. What more can you ask from a guy to start off perfect? Okay, dropped off just a little, and then got came back to his dominance again. I hmm. I think the guy I, I think the guy is one of the most talented dudes, uh, you know, in the in the cinema world right now. I agree. And La La Land's not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination. No, it's just no. you know, it's a Hollywood stroke off, and I I accept that. Yeah, and gonna, yeah. yeah, and and it uses it uses jazz, and it's like pretty white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty pretty white movie, extremely white. And so when you're going against Moonlight, which like actually chose to be, you know, we're gonna have representation, have an all black cast, and we're gonna make a movie for movie's sake, for storytelling's sake. Yeah, it's it's very hard to take take one more seriously than the other. <laughs> and I got to you know say, I mean? I'm not a big fan of La La Land's message, which yeah, is neither, neither basically like talent will get you far. <laughs> no, not in this world. You can be good at anything. You can be amazing. But if you don't have connections or if you're not like in the right place at the right time, no one's ever going to fucking know. And this film really is, you know, as long as you follow your dreams, they'll happen. And that's some horse shit. <laughs> Well, and, and you know, you know, my my adoration for Ryan Gosling is, you know, through the roof. I, I think the guy is is a mastermind, uh, you know, kind of performer. And I think that movie does him a bit of disservice because I think that character, I think there's somewhere that that movie could have gone. That was really dark. Yeah. And, you know, that's where Whiplash went at moments where you're like, whoa, like tunnel vision musician. I'm going to do whatever it takes. But Sebastian's character is like, he kind of, you know, goes back and forth and doesn't know what to do. And Emma Stone, I, I really like her, but I, I, I thought that performance was a tad overrated. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's good. It's fine. What's, what's most incredible about La La Land though, is, is, is Damien Giselle is the guy behind the camera and his, his eye for, for palettes, for landscape, for colors, for all that stuff. He clearly has done his work, has done his homework, has done his research. Yeah, totally. You could feel that from the first epic musical number on the highway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> good Lord. That was just like, oh, okay, we're, I see what we're watching. <laughs> uh, moving on to Lion. Uh, this is a true story as well of an Indian boy named Saru, Bre- Saru Breerly, who got lost as a child in India, got on the wrong train, ended up 1,200 miles from his village. He didn't know his village's name, and he didn't know his mother's last name. So he ends up in an orphanage, gets adopted by an Australian family, grows up, raised by them, and then one day something clicks, and he uses Google Earth to track down his birth mother. It's a very inspiring story, very heartwarming, and just incredible how it all worked out. Um, if you haven't seen Lion, if you need to pick me up, I recommend checking this movie out. Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I think, I think Lion is, is one of those movies that you can throw into a best picture, you know, ring. And it kind of, you know, keeps people, keeps people on their toes. I think it, I feel the same way about it as I do something like Life of Pi. Uh, just kind of keeps it a little fresh. You know, it's not, not everything has to be a moonlight or not everything has to be a La La Land. You do have those just kind of movies for everybody. And I think that's what, I think that's what Lion is. I, I don't see anyone out there who'd be like, God, that sucked. You know, it's a, it's a good story. It'll make you feel good. You might not love everything about it, 
but it's it, it's storytelling wise, it's it's solid. Well, and Lion really shines a light on the horrific uh, conditions for orphans in India. Just how horribly children are treated. They're sold to drug dealers and just like abused constantly. They're almost like a commodity. So I love that this movie shined a light on how fucking sick that is. And I hope they were able to, you know, get some help. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, film films always a good way. Or earlier we called war films propaganda and, you know, people are always going to try to put their message out there and yep. sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Yes, indeed. And that takes us to our final film, Manchester by the sea. Yes. Uh, and um, a man going through some serious personal reflection uh, ends up the reluctant guardian of his nephew after his brother dies unexpectedly. And Casey Affleck plays this guy who has just gone through the worst tragedy a human being can go through and is forced to kind of find some love again. And it's tough going. And I appreciate the message. I thought it's, it was written really well. I just, Casey Affleck does not, do it for me. I think he, I don't, I don't get the appreciation. I just don't, I don't see him as that particularly talented. I think he just kind of rolls it off and plays sad. He just looks constantly like he's about to cry. I just don't buy it. I think he's got a much more talented brother. (laughs) Yeah. See, I don't think either of them have like totally impressed me. Um, Ben, ben Affleck in, in Gone Girl and The Town. Those two, Wolf, you know, I think he's awesome. But for Casey, I think he... Ah, yeah, I think he's best. And I hate just kind of putting guys in boxes and how dare I, you know, who am I to say? But I think Casey Affleck is best in a, you know, supporting role as as a buddy or, you know, a guy at the bar. I. I think he has a really interesting charisma and his voice, his voice fascinates me, but he, I don't think he totally knows how to uh, like read people and kind of, kind of read energy in a scene. There's, there's, there's times where I feel like he's misplaced. Well, just Um, like watching Michelle Williams totally overpower him as an actor she's dominating this the scene where they finally confront each other and he's just like almost whisper acting to her. He doesn't know where to go. Like she's so over the top and powerful. And he's just like in her shadow cowering almost. And like, doesn't know how to fight back with his particular talent. And I just don't, I don't understand why he took home best actor for this. I don't, I thought he was miscast and just out of his depth. Yeah, well, it was apparently supposed to be Matt Damon's. Uh, oh, well, Damon's there you role. go. <laughs> yeah, Matt Damon's the one who kind of said, "Hey, you can have this," because he, yeah, Damon was a producer of this movie, and well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to play uh, Lee Chandler. Yeah, it was supposed to be. So it's supposed to be Matt Damon and Lucas Hedges. Yeah, which they they kind of look like. Yeah. God damn. Yeah, that would have this. That would have been so much better. Oh yeah, I just I I don't like. The best thing I've seen Casey Affleck in is that SNL sketch where he plays a dude who's frequently going to Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, so good. That's the best. So good. Yeah, he did such he did a great job just playing a Boston asshole in that one sketch. He just chucks his coffee at the guy's car. Yeah. yeah. Like that. So I don't know. I have my hang ups with Casey Affleck. Like, like, have you seen Out of the Furnace with Christian Bale? Not yet. That's where I think Casey is like, that's his home. I think he's really, really good in that movie. I was trying to, you know, rack my brain for something that I can kind of like reference. Um, of course, in Good Will Hunting, like he's hilarious as, you know, this, this young punk yeah. uh, alongside, alongside his brother and, and Matt Damon. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think, I think we agree all together though on his career. We're just not like totally sold. And on this performance as Lee Chandler in Manchester by the Sea, and this movie as a whole, we're both a bit underwhelmed. Uh, I I do remember, you know, when I first saw it in theaters, I, there were a couple of scenes that like brought me to tears, mm. um, and that's mostly that's mostly due to Lucas Hedges. Um, yeah, he he, I, yeah, he was he was unbelievable. Just the way he says, like, "You gotta unlock the car if you want me to do what you say." You know, 
<laughs> you know, just Lucas has a way of, yeah, a way of just kind of shattering me uh, with the smallest little sentence. So, yeah. Well, of Casey Affleck's competition, I think like I, of that five, I would probably give it to Denzel for fences. Um, but, you know, I still got to see Captain Fantastic, so we'll see. Yeah, Vigo, Vigo's got my vote. So that's our, you know, best picture showdown. I think in the end, Moonlight's a, yeah, Moonlight earned it. I mean, as much as I love Hacksaw Ridge and it would have been cool, Moonlight is a special film for what it brought to the table, and I, I am glad it has the award. Yeah, for for me personally as a fan, like just what I like, it's in my brain, it's not close. And then I I agree with what you're saying about how I think it's important that it won and kind of needed to win amongst these other films and especially against its, you know, main competitor, La La Land. Uh, I'm really glad that we got the outcome that we did. I think, I think it's one of those movies that also, you know, just kind of gives you, gives you kind of respect and gives you, uh, you know, a little, you know, a little positivity about the, about the Academy when a movie like Moonlight wins and it's re-released back into theaters, it, it has a chance to make a lot more money. True. And, And that is exactly what happened with Moonlight. It basically doubled down, made, made double what it's worth because nobody not nobody but a lot of people were just like well i don't know uh that trailer looks that looks kind of like an arty artsy fartsy movie do i really want to see that and who are naomi harris and marsha lee ah you know and then it got the word of mouth and then it won best picture and it it like made double the amount of money (laughs) in, in in the box office and then people were like oh shit i i gotta see this what's going on here and And in turn, it sold, you know, DVDs sell. And when a movie wins Best Picture, whether anybody wants to, you know, agree with it or not, it is maybe not a big deal, but it's a deal. It's a big deal. I'll say that. It's a very big deal for film for, people. Yeah. For this movie, it's a huge deal. Because if that doesn't happen, who knows if Barry Jenkins is able to move on and go make If Beale Street could talk. Who knows what happens finance wise? Who knows what happens with A24, da da da, you know, so on and so forth. Who knows what happens with Mahersha Ali? All these things, you know. Yeah. I, I think I think when a movie is recognized and rewarded, especially with that top prize, it just is gonna turn some heads. And in turn, that gets money going. And ultimately that's what matters for this stuff to keep moving and to keep being made. Money. You we we as fans gotta got to go see them got to invest in the art and i'm okay with that 100 percent. it's you know why i'm here now i consider this one of my missions in life is to support film yes agreed fantastic you ready to give out some awards beautiful yeah let's just jump right in we have uh we've got our our awards here for moonlight um obviously we dig this movie and we've had some fun kind of talking about some certain aspects but let's go ahead and just jump right in. We have our Tarantino, uh, best quote or line. We got our Ennio Morricone for the best music moment. Lots to choose from. We have the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award for best performance. And we have the Roger Deakins Award for the best scene. So, Connor, take it away with your Tarantino. This was tough. This was oh. tough. Um, it took me a long time to get to get one that I thought was really worthy. And it finally popped out when uh, Black goes to visit his mom in rehab. Oh, boy. And uh, she's trying to apologize and tell him, you know, you can still be saved. And she says the line, uh, your heart ain't got to be black like mine. And I thought that was very powerful considering like the implications of how far gone he already is because of the lack of people, like the lack of love in his life, the lack of people in his corner. Acceptance. Yeah. Acceptance on multiple levels and just having her as a mother who's just been a constant source of pain for him and for her to, to say something like that. I just, you can see in his eyes, the look of like, how dare you? And it's, it's just a very powerful uh, moment. Mm, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. I love when black stands up and he's like, really though? 
Yeah. Oh man, just and and then he he sits back down, but the oh, one tear, the tear, the like you can see how much he's fighting to show any emotion, and just that one tear escapes. It's God damn, he did such a great job. Uh, Trevante Rhodes, right? Yes. Fucking amazing. <laughs> I, I I I thought. I thought I I don't see a weak link in this movie. I thought everyone did their part, and it is it's why the triptych you know storytelling it's why it works. Yeah, because all six actors for the the two main guys, the two boys, and of course Janelle Monae and uh, Mahersha Ali and Naomi Harris are just <laughs> awesome. Oh man, that's that's a good one. This. This movie specifically, you know, we've been doing these awards now for a little while. And for this movie specifically had me thinking about this award, the Tarantino, and just kind of like what I think it is. And I've had I've had some lines that were kind of long, and I've had some really short ones, and trying to find like, what exactly do I think makes a best line from a movie? Because you, know, you could have a whole monologue from someone that's just incredible, or like the speech in Great Dictator... Like, of course, that's going to win the Tarantino. But I think it's I think you and I have both kind of figured out that it's about finding a piece, a piece of the writing. Yeah, that that as a, as you know, we both like to write ourselves and we both like to read when you see it or hear it. it you immediately it kind of you kind of like your skin just kind of jumps and you get the hairs on the back of your neck, you know, just kind of go up. And that's when, you know, you're oh, I'm I'm inside a story. And I think what you just pointed out, it, it, it does that exactly. Just when you think Moonlight might get boring and might come into a lull, you have this third act where he has to confront these things in his life now. Yeah. He has to have a conversation with Paula. He has to have a conversation with Kevin, which is one of my favorite touches of the entire movie is when we see, we see Black and he wakes up because the phone's ringing. And you see on the phone, it doesn't say mom. It says Paula. Yeah. He's changed the contact name from mom to Paula because he does not have a relationship with this person as a mother. And we see that, you know, you would think the movie is going to like, oh, no way is it going to be as exciting as it's been. And as, you know, you know, is is just incredible. But no, it kind of heightens it. (laughs) It makes it more reflective and more incredible. So I, I love that. And with that said, my Tarantino also goes to one of the later stages of the movie. It would be the uh, in the middle of the diner scene between uh, Chiron and, and Kevin. That'd be Andre Holland and Trevante Rhodes. Uh, it's actually a moment where Chiron decides he's just not talking and he won't respond to anything Kevin's saying. And Kevin says, hey, these grandma rules, man, you know the deal. Your ass eat, your ass speak. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and that that for that for me is like one of the reasons i watch movies is to he, to to hear lines like that that i haven't heard in my own life my i've never had a male you know whatever relative or whatever say anything like that um in the same way that i feel like a rap album is storytelling i feel like kevin the way he carries himself is a guy i don't know but i want to know and i want to get to know and i want to learn about him and i want to hear what stories he has to tell and that's partly due to andre holland just being like he's on a stage in that that whole diner scene andre's just andre's got all of the swagger in the fucking world and i I love that bit and i love when he says that and it kind of kind of gets Chiron to be a little kid again. Uh, he kind of like, kind of, kind of opens up just a little bit. And I love, I love lines like that, that just kind of take me away to a different place. And I know I'm being told a story that I haven't heard. I love that line. Fantastic. I love your reasoning behind it. That's, that's great. Yeah. Film is a great way for us to experience cultures apart from our own, you know, and embrace stories that are alien to us. And appreciate it all the more i love that for, for sure I, I you know one of my favorite lines is 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 the line we brought up from from one when he literally says out loud a faggot is a word that people use to make gay people feel bad 
I almost chose that as my Tarantino. It's like, good God, when you write, when you're writing that down, I mean, it's just so plain and simple the way it's put, but that, that is like, that's the sentence. Like that is the sentence people need to hear at a young age. If they're being called names because of the way they feel sexually, someone needs to tell them those words are not cool. And this is why, and you don't need to let people call you that. And that that's, that's it, man. You know, that, like that kind of storytelling, I've never had someone had to tell me that it's fucking crazy to take your, yeah. Put yourself in these, you know, put, put yourself in this perspective. And that's, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. You know, that's why you and I watch fucking movies. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Beautiful. Enyo, Enyo Morricone. Best music moment. What, what do you got? Nicholas Bertel. He's back for a second time. Beale Street. We had a hard time with that one. This is an even better score. Yeah, he's just a master of subtlety. Um, and for me, like there were a lot of moments I almost picked, but there was one that just was perfect due almost entirely to build up. And it's the score that's playing in the bathroom after Chiron gets the shit kicked out of him. And he's got his face in the sink and you just feel this like, like drone start to get bigger and bolder as he heads to the classroom to fight back. And I thought that was just perfect. Like it felt like a, you know, a fuse on a bomb was about to go off. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. Basically (laughs) the bomb exploded. So yeah, that's my Morricone. Oh Yeah can't argue with that um yeah you're obviously referring to when chiron decides to hit the shit out of terrell with the chair yeah everything Um, from the chiron in the bathroom to that the the score that's playing there and that whole everything about that stretch when he yeah when he dunks his face into the the ice bath and the sink and then just starts swinging doors open at the school and you actually you actually see the security guard that helped him up when he got the shit knocked out of him you see him for a second as he's kind of storming through and you just kind of see him look back like "Uh oh like almost like he knows he's gonna go do something but he's like no that fucker deserves it though and like almost like lets him pass like i don't think i'm stopping chiron today (laughs) he's on a mission and when he finally gets to the door and the camera pans to the left, holy shit. Yeah. It just, and the teacher, the teacher's reaction, just, just like, ah, oh, like for a moment, he doesn't even know what to do. He, and he doesn't react. Uh, it's an unbelievable moment in that movie. Uh, and that's the last time Chiron sees Kevin as he's leaving the school to get in the cop car. That's the last time he sees him for whatever, 10 years. Um, amazing. Excellent choice. (laughs) Ah, man. I I don't know all the track names, but, uh, this, the one I chose for my Inyo is, uh, is called ride home. And that would be when, uh, Juan is taking, taking little home for the first time in his car. And that, that's one of my favorite moments of the movie. Not only the score is just beautiful. Like you said, King of subtlety, Nicholas Bertel, but it's, it's what it's paired with, you know, it's this drug dealer, you know, kind of like boss looking, you know, dude in a do rag and, you know, in this awesome Cadillac and, and then this little kid, both these, you know, both these guys are black and they're riding through Miami yet every movie I've seen with that has just rap songs playing in the background. But this movie, Barry Jenkins, like he said, he brought the art house to the hood. He decides to play a beautiful score with all these different instruments happening while we're looking at these palm trees in the projects of Miami. And no one's ever done that. No one does that. And those are the decisions Barry Jenkins made that I think those things add up and those things count. When you make those decisions, filmmaking is decision after decision after decision and edit after edit. And those things matter. (laughs) And I think all the stuff, again, what you said about him, you know, kind of dunking his face in and then he's about to go 
about to go smash somebody with a chair, yet the score is still subtle. It's swelling, but it's subtle. It's swelling, but it's subtle. And with the ride home, it's like it's like a main intent is to get you to cry, just the music. And then you look at what's happening on the screen, and that's ultimately what we're doing here with the Inyo is finding what's the best moment in the movie that also involves music. Yeah. Uh, and I think we I think we both pinpointed something special to both of us. Uh, I love what that award has become. Yeah, man, it's great beautiful so cool uh obviously this is a big one um the philip seymour hoffman award yeah this kind of is the one that really to me shows how we both see the movie every time we've done this it's been either we're on the same page or we are vastly different and i i love that yeah i love that you know like i think some prime examples would be like the apartment you know i chose jack lemon you you chose shirley mcclain obviously those are the two people that carry it i saw jack lemon carrying it a little bit heavier and you were like no surely it's doing a little more work yeah. chinatown i said jack nicholson you said faye dunaway um uh, i wouldn't be surprised if that happens here again so go ahead all right um to me i think just for the strength of the performance and the very small amount of time to prepare and the fact that she's british and playing a character like this it's naomi harris as paula same <laughs> oh really all right i was i was certain you were gonna go mahershala on this one no i yeah naomi yeah beautiful beautiful yeah she's unbelievable in this film that she had to do out of order over a span of like three days yeah that's 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 the main thing here is um it would be like i don't even know what to compare it to there there is no occupation you know <laughs> equivalent to doing what she did and as powerful the performance is. Um, and the, the, the main thing would be that or the, the character of Paula is, <clears throat> is not just Naomi. And, you know, I think this is up to Barry Jenkins as well is it's the way she is filmed specifically in this movie from the, you know, when she screams and it's, you know, blocked out and you can't hear anything, it's muted. Uh, and then she starts walking into the room and the door slams. That's not necessarily her performance as it is just the way she's, you know, presented. Yeah. But, but those things added up in my mind. Um, another one would be when she's kind of coming down from a high uh, and she's talking to Chiron and Barry Jenkins just makes the incredible decision to have words coming out, except we don't see her mouth moving at all. So she's like, we clearly see not just the way she's acting, but the way the camera and audio is, we clearly see that she's disoriented. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that is something to do with the movie itself. But Naomi Harris, like her ride through this movie is just fucking flooring. And from the last moment when she can't even light her own cigarette anymore and the the fact that this lady's from England just kind of kind of seeps into my skin. Like she shouldn't be able to do this for this well. Um, I I'll let that bleed into my own deacons because she's a part of it. Um, and you brought it up just slightly earlier. It'd be it'd be when uh, Juan confronts her. Uh, my deacons. This is one of my favorite movies of all time, and definitely one of my favorite scenes of all time. Uh, doesn't involve Chiron at all except that these two people know who he is. <laughs> so it definitely does involve him. Um, to, paint, to paint the whole scene out, it is when Juan is going to a corner that we've seen him go to a few times in the movie um, and visiting with a guy that he's clearly visited with. And he lights a cigarette and he's kind of like, all right, everything's been good, you know. And his buddy's like, yeah, you know, everything's cleaned out. It's in the cut if you want to go get it. And then... Mahershal Ali, you know, takes a drag and looks up, you know, looks out the corner of his eye and sees two people getting high on, on the spot, which is, which is just a no, no from just watching, you know, you, you and I know that from watching fucking Goodfellas, you know, we, <laughs> you don't need to be anybody to know that like you, you don't do that. And, you know, so he walks up to the car and, you know, throws his cigarette down and realizes who it is. 
realizes it's Paula. It's Chiron's mom. Get the fuck out of the car. And she gets out and they proceed to have dialogue that is just, this is what the, this is what the medium's for. Yeah. This dialogue that they're having, you know, so profound. She, she's selling, you know, she, sorry, selling. She's smoking crack in his face, and he's the one who supplies it in this area of Miami. And she's just telling him how it is. Who is you? Are you going to raise my son? You know, like who the hell are you to tell me how to live my life when you're the one who's selling me the fucking rocks? And you know, he has. There's nothing he can say. You know. Yeah. Nothing he can do. He 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 knows it's true. He knows this is this is what his life is, and this is the decisions he's made in his own you know in his own path as as one as a man. And there's no ifs ands or you know buts about it. Like he he has to confront that and reflect on that in that moment. And it just happens to be the mother of this kid that he's taking a liking to. And everything about it, everything about it, the the street lights the way they kind of just kind of orchestrate what's happening. They're flickering, flickering here and there and whatever exact area that is that Barry Jenkins just shows the exact right street for all that to happen. And, and those two specifically Mahershala Ali and Naomi Harris just going toe to toe in, yeah. In one of the, you know, most incredible scenes I've ever, you know, uh, encountered. Fantastic. It is a, you know, it's a divisive scene because it really is, A, it forces the audience to pick a side. Yes. B, it really does make, you know, Juan reflect on what do I do next? You know, I want to protect this kid, but I got to do right by me. Like, there's no real decision to make here. And he knows that. And so, so does she, and she exploits it. It's, it's vicious, and it's real. And I totally get why you picked that. Yeah, hell yeah, man. What what do you got? I have one I've brought up already as well, and it's when Chiron whacks the shit out of Terrell with a chair. It's <sighs> the build up to that is perfect, and it's the scene for me where Chiron decides who he's going to be in life. He has toyed with the idea with the, exploring his sexuality. He he knows that in his world he'll never be accepted like that. And he also knows that if he doesn't stand up for himself, they're going to kill him one day. He's, he's a product of his environment. Yeah. yeah. So he decides, I'm taking a stand. He whacks Terrell with a chair, gets arrested, and then that defines the rest of his life. But yeah. it is that moment that turns Chiron into black. And the rest of the movie expands from that. And I love butterfly effect moments in films where you can pinpoint that's the moment right there where everything changed. Oh, for sure. I, I think, I think this movie, I think that's what, what its intentions are is to, is to pinpoint moments that do change you as a person that yeah. do all that alter your life that actually make your life different, whether it be something small, like, uh, well, not small, but in this movie, it's small compared to what happens to, to Chiron. But like when he has to wear the same clothes twice because his mom is fucking acting up and trying to get money from him and he goes, get to school because you're going to be late and doesn't allow him to shower and change clothes, you know, because he stayed the night at Teresa's, Janelle Monet's house the, the night before. And those little things, you know, and then the big things of like, <laughs> of not being able to even comfortably explore his sexuality you know or, or figure out what it is you know uh just immediately like you said just kind of kind of has to, well is forced to make a decision and the decision he makes is well if this place is so fucked up and so messed up i'm gonna go ahead and make sure i get something done here because i hate that guy and that guy has caused me a lot of pain and a lot of other people pain and you get it you totally get it yeah. yeah. Leading up to that moment, he's talking to uh, an authority figure and she's like, you're being like, you're being a bozo. Like there should be other four other guys in here. And he's like, you don't get it. Like you don't get it. They're going to kill me, dude. They will kill me. 
I love in that scene when the dialogue of the principal or counselor or whoever like fades out as she's saying, I understand. Yeah. Oh, and she that's when the music, the music starts. Yeah. You yeah. can tell by her lips that she said something of like, I, I understand or I get it. Mm-hmm. And they cut that out because no, the, no, she fucking doesn't. She can't yeah. possibly. It's the editing there and the, the music decisions are fucking perfect. Yeah. Great. <laughs> masterpiece. Absolute masterpiece. I had a blast, man. Um, uh, no other way I'd want to spend my 26th birthday than talking about uh, Moonlight. Certainly one of my favorite movies of the past, you know, decade uh, and, and, and is, is right up there, you know, uh, for all time. It's definitely my favorite movie that we've covered on this show, uh, along with Chinatown. I adore Chinatown. But Moonlight is, is clearly, as we've talked about it, it's just even more special now. Uh, as, you, as you just kind of peel back the layers of a film and when a film has that as many as Moonlight, I have a hard time looking the other way. <laughs> I, I really, I really do love this, this one. It's a through and through 10 for me. Uh, and I, it's, it's going to be kind of in my stream of conscience forever. Yeah. I give it an, an eight. It's a great movie. Phenomenal. I understand all the love for it. And uh, yeah, repeated viewings. It, it will probably go up. Hell yeah, man. Good stuff. Well, yeah, hopefully Barry Jenkins will, uh, you know, continue to succeed and, Maybe he'll make another moonlight one day. Maybe. I mean, not many directors have managed to capture lightning in a bottle twice, but it does happen. It can. It can. It just, yeah, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. So what do we got going on next week? Next week is going to be just oodles. Oodles of fun. <laughs> uh, you know, mo- moonlight and uh, a best picture showdown uh, next week. We're going to, you know, pop the brakes a bit and take, take it a little easier. We're going to, we're going to you know, introduce ourselves academia-wise to Paul Thomas Anderson. Boogie Nights, 1997. Uh, <laughs> it was up for three awards at the 70th Academy Awards. But we're, we're mainly just talking about Boogie. We're going to talk a little bit about Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, that The cast of that movie is just absolutely bonkers. It's, you know, we're going to give awards out to that and just kind of have fun with it. Talk about, talk about the cast, talk about PTA little bit of 70th Academy Awards. Uh, just, just come on back and have some fun. It won't be, won't be as heavy as this one here. Um, <laughs> you know, these Best Picture Showdowns are really special. They're, they're a way for us to s- select one year and pick a group of movies and just kind of dive into them and, and, and immerse ourselves into them. And I, I had a lot of fun revisiting these over the past month uh, for the 89th Academy Awards, and I'm looking forward to it uh, for the next Best Picture Showdown. Uh, which would be episode 40. But these in between, we're going to be having fun. We're going to be picking movies that that kind of pop. Uh, it's either going to be a movie that neither of us have seen, you know, for the first time. We're going to, like, try to find stuff like Gaslight. And then we're going to also pick, you know, just awesome classic stuff like Shrek or Chinatown. Uh, that's the way it's going to go. And Boogie Nights is most certainly a movie that I I just, I love and I can't get enough of. Fuck yeah, man. This is awesome. I love the way this show is kind of, progressed um be sure to check out uh josh and i's episode on the return of the living dead on wednesday on the filmgasm podcast and of course tomorrow we'll have a sneak preview for you yes thanks very much for listening we'll see you next sunday keep watching movies